All right. Welcome back. Mike here, another Watchman Thinking Out Loud, TOL. Wow, guys. I think um, Brother Chooch over at TOL End Times may have seen my last video and heard my comment about him being occupied planning the great lobster dinner after the rapture, you know, with Jesus as the guest of honor. Because right after uh, I, I shared that video, uh, he posted on his community page the current numbers for the lobsters needed right here. He says, uh, we'd like to praise Jesus and thank you for TL End Times reaching 35,000 subs. That amounts to over 70,000 lobsters. That will require a very large pot and a ton or two of butter. <laughs> well, I love it. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to clarify too, this, this is a surf and turf dinner. Okay, so if you don't care for lobster, just pass yours over to the brother or sister sitting next to you at the dinner and just enjoy your petite filet. And uh, Chooch, if you need any help setting the table, you know, I'm happy to help. So let me know. All right, guys. Well, so much unsealing of scripture has been going on in the Watchman community, um, ramped up in the last couple of weeks. And I can also say with me personally, you know, so much I can't, you know, keep up. Um, so not only the pace and convergence of world events is screaming that the rapture and the tribulation is very, very close at hand, a la Matthew 24, but also the intense accelerated pace of scriptural revelations that's being given by the Holy Spirit to all the watchmen is screaming that we are on the threshold of the heavenly door being opened extremely soon. So I, I definitely believe we are in the season. It's really hard to believe at this point that it's going to be another year. Um, so let's get into this, guys. Um, so today we're going to cover yet another massive revelation that may strongly indicate the timing of the rapture. And this revelation uh, comes from Daniel 10, and of course, many other places in scripture that we're going to look at. But before we take a look at Daniel... I want to summarize in a single slide what I covered in great detail in my last video, um, because I believe very, very strongly that the sign of Jonah is the rapture. Okay. Now I want to pause here for just a second and reiter reiterate something that I state repeatedly in most of my videos. I am not a date setter. I am not setting a date for the rapture and I never will be. It's my belief based on the typologies in scripture, the archetypes, etc., that the Passover unleavened bread first fruits feast season of the Lord present as the strongest candidates for the rapture, especially when you consider that the church represents the body of Christ, Jesus's earthly fleshly body from 2000 years ago that walked the earth has been represented in its fullness by the body of Christ in the whole of the church. Scripture is very clear about this. So if Christ's body rose from the dead on Nisan 17, and he received his glorified body then, does the church also rise and receive glorified bodies on that same day? It makes the most sense to me, and I believe it would make the most sense for the world at large that is looking for a sign. And that sign, the sign of Jonah, would provide the world with an incredibly powerful proof of the truth in God's word, and it will convert many, which is what God wants. So remembering that part of the supernatural sign in Jonah were, if it's true, that all 70 languages were spoken on the boat that he was on, and they witnessed the supernatural event of the storm picking up and calming down every time they lifted up Jonah and placed him back in the water on the rope then they witness something supernatural and the the story goes right that all those folks on the boat immediately sailed back to Joppa after Jonah had disappeared they sailed back to Joppa went to Jerusalem and they converted so that's a picture of the entire world like a mass conversion event of the entire world happening at the sign of the rapture right so here we see i have three columns here with bullet points and i just want to cover these here Jonah Jesus and the church they all represent the same thing. Jonah was a prophet and a messenger. Uh, he slept on a boat in a storm. Jesus did all the same things. Okay. Um, the When Jonah was placed in the water, 
um, the, so the storm was supernaturally calmed. Okay. We know that Jesus supernaturally calmed the storm and he had control over it. Okay. Jonah disappeared right after Jonah disappeared. What happened? The boat sails back to Joppa. Everybody on board that boat gives up their pagan gods and religions and they convert to Judaism they get circumcised and they convert. Okay. So, um, so that disappearance of Jonah created this event. The disappearance of Jesus, right? After he disappeared from the tomb and then appeared to people, random people all over the place, that helped people believe, okay? So Jonah, dead two days, rose on the third day, right? Figuratively dead two days, being in the, in the, you know, in the heart of the fish in the sea, right? Because the sea means death, Davy Jones Locker, right? Jesus, dead two days, risen on the third day. Okay, pre-dawn, pre-dawn. Okay, Jonah. He was warning of repentance. Jesus did the same thing. He did it when he was calling out to the Pharisees that, you know, no sign's going to be given to you guys, the wicked and adulterous perverse generation, except the sign of Jonah. Um, again, the we also with Jonah, we had two resurrections because if he were the boy that was resurrected by, um, uh, by uh, e Elijah, okay, when he was just a little boy, um, then he was figuratively resurrected again when he was spat out of the fish. Okay. Now the church, there's also kind of two resurrections there that match up to that, right? Because there was the first resurrection of the dead back in, you know, 30 or 31 or whenever Jesus died on the cross and he, uh, went down and, and took cap, you know, captivity captive and rescued people and, um, so there was a resurrection of the dead. There were, you know, hundreds of people, you know, that were resurrected from the dead that appeared to, uh, Jewish family members and friends and stuff around Jerusalem. Okay. So that was one resurrection. And then there's the second resurrection, which happens in the rapture, the resurrection of the dead, those dead that have been dead for two days, the last 2000 years, remember second Peter three, eight, a day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. It's mentioned twice. That's because two days equals 2000 years, right? So there's the dead in Christ represented over the last 2000 years and those dead in Christ make up the vast majority, you know, 99 point whatever percent of the body of Christ dead in the tomb. Okay. So they're waiting on their glorified bodies. Okay. So, um, if the church, and again, the, the church, I'm not a prophet, you're not a prophet, right? Because prophets are, they come out of Jerusalem, but but the church is, is pointing people. We are prophesying. We are pointing people to, the language that the prophets are using in scripture um, and leveraging the work that's already been done. So in that sense, we're, we're, we're announcing the prophetic word that's already written. Okay. And we're doing that through the Holy spirit. We are a body of messengers. Remember Christ, we, we can't, we can do no good thing unless Christ is dwelling within us, right? It's not me that does the good thing. It's Christ dwelling within me. So we are all part of that body. We are body, a body of messengers. Okay. Christ is working through this massive body, the church to get his words out, the good news out. Okay. Um, so we, we are built, we build our houses on a foundation so that when the storm comes, right, we build our houses on the rock. Okay. That's the foundation is Jesus Christ, the rock. When we do that, when the storm comes, then we're not tossed around in the waves. Okay. Do you see how that lines up with what goes on with Jonah? and everything in Jesus and the storm. Okay. So we are calm in the storm because we build our foundation on the rock, Jesus Christ. The church will also be disappeared. Remember Jesus even said, um, destroy this temple and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and it, it'll be rebuilt in three days and it'll be raised in three days. Okay. So he's, he's not just talking about his own body, but he's talking about his body, the church as well. We are the temple. There's plenty of scriptures to support this. Every one of us is a block, a building block, a stone that builds that temple of the Lord. Okay. So, you know, Jesus is saying that his human body is going to be as a temple is going to be disappeared. Okay. And then raised up in three days. Well, that happens with the church. The church will be disappeared in the rapture and it is raised up after two days, 2000 years. Okay. So we're on the cusp of that happening. So we're also warning of repentance. Um, and of course the, 
the resurrection of Jonah being spat out of the fish that, that created belief, even just watching him get swallowed by the fish and disappearing his disappearance to those on the boat with the supernatural events, with the storm calming down, as soon as that happened, that made them believe. Okay. Jesus, his resurrection, uh, that created belief rapture. That's also going to create belief. Okay. So all of these three things are identical. They're all talking about the same thing. Now, I want to get into this Daniel revelation here because it is it is big. Okay, it is big. Um, oh, and by the way, before I do that, I just want to call out this right here. So this chart right here, let me zoom in on this a little bit. This chart right here is showing the number of deaths. Uh, I forget what website I got this from, but I got it from a statistics website. But it shows the, the births okay, since one CE, okay, since basically Christ's time, all right? So if we, and I, I kind of, we're, there's a transition here between 1900 and 1950, okay? And I kind of, and I made that orange there because there's still a lot of people from 1950 who are still alive, right? So not all of these people that were born here in 1950 are dead, okay, in this time frame here. So I want to just count the folks that have died because I think it's safe to say that all these people that have been birthed here in rows two, three, seven, they've come and gone. All right. If somebody was born in 1900, they're, they're gone. They're not here anymore. So these are deaths now in the last, um, you know, 2000 years. So that sums up to 95, um, uh, what is that? 95 billion people, 95.5 billion people. Okay, now I know only a small percentage of those took the narrow path, okay? And most of those people took the broad path that leads to destruction. But even then, if you consider, I don't know, 1%, 2%, okay, of those people, that is a massive number. This represents the body of Christ that's been in the tomb for the last two days, essentially, that needs to be risen and receive glorified bodies, okay? So we who are alive and remain, all right, we are just mere crumbs. We're just a few crumbs left over after the sheer volume, that number of dead in Christ who have been waiting to receive their glorified bodies for two days. So realize, guys, how privileged we are to be this exceptionally tiny population of crumbs that make up the group of those who are alive and remain, right? So this chart right here, which... If I zoom in on this, this is a good way to visualize this. Each grain of sand in this visualization represents 10 million people. 140 million children are born every year. 14 grains of sand enter the hourglass. You are here. These 795 grains represent 7.95 billion people who are alive today on planet Earth. Now, I recognize that a small percentage of this almost 8 billion people on Earth right now are believers in Christ sealed with the Holy Spirit. I understand that. So you can see there are just a few crumbs right now compared to the massive number of crumbs, grains of sand in this hourglass. And again, a small percentage of these do make up the body of Christ that's you know dead and waiting to receive glorified bodies over the last two days or 2000 years, okay? So just, it's a good visual. Okay. And just think about like how incredibly lucky we are to be those few crumbs alive at the moment that this happens at this moment in time in history, when this is going to happen. Incredible. Now I want to play this clip from Dr. Barry Awe really quick here and uh, listen very, very, very carefully to what he says. And then we're going to get into this Daniel 10 thing. I think it's like, it's right, right in front of us. But we know oh, it might go, it might go another, it might go another. And, you know, lately we've been saying, you know, sometime in the next four years. But again, I want to rule out whatever I can. And so when you get past 25, now you're talking about Jesus had to be on the cross later than 33 and 34 and 35. So it's like we can, we can block off the far future. And we, we really, now we've seen how the past was not really a good opportunity for the rapture, but a great opportunity for watchmen. And now the far future past 25 is not a good time for the rapture. So 
let's let's keep our excitement up and keep our witnessing up because I believe this is our year and it could be as soon as April 26 or 7. We could also go earlier, you know. I wanted to make this quick so I'm not showing a ton of scriptures, but Mr. Bones, do you remember when Moses erected the tabernacle that uh, afterwards he was not able to go into? Oh yeah, that was cross later than 33 and 34 and 35. So it's like we can we can block off the fall. Okay. All right, so right there, guys, right there. Did you hear what Barry all said? Um, he's saying that we could go April like 25th, 26th, or we could even go earlier. And the next point that he makes there is that the earlier point in time that we could go is essentially, you know, like the first day of the first month. Well, that's already passed. We're sitting here on Nissan three right now. So our window right now, according to Barry Aw, and I completely agree with him is between right now and well, like May 3rd. All right. Um, early May. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at this. We're going to get into this. All right. Um, make sure I'm good here. Okay. So does the rapture happen before Nissan 24? We're going to look at this guys. And I believe it does. Daniel 10. Daniel's vision of a man. The man is Jesus. Spoiler alert. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. That great war is on the cusp of happening, guys. We're already in World War III. It just hasn't gone nuclear and super massive. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. You can go to Daniel 9 and see why he's mourning. Okay, he's mourning because of the Jews really not turning to God and turning to idols and worthless things. And he, he realizes the guilt, the guilt of the Jews um, and their adultery and everything else. So he mourned for three weeks. I, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So he's doing kind of a, a, a version of a fast here. It's not an abstaining from food altogether fast, but it's no choice food, okay, and no meat and no wine. All right, so, um, and he used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So three weeks is 21 days, right? So on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. We're looking at the NIV here. The KJV is the same exact word. The sound of a multitude. So when does Daniel have this vision? He has it on the 24th day of the first month. That is Nisan 24. That is rapidly approaching. When he hears this vision and he sees Jesus Christ, he hears his voice like the sound of a multitude. That's because, that's because as you can see here in Ephesians 1.22, the church, which is Christ's body and the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That's why the voice is that of the multitude or a multitude, because the raptured church is already there when Daniel has this vision. And when does he have the vision? Nisan 24, the 24th day of the first month. And by the time he's experiencing this vision of things yet to come that are about to take place for our time right now, okay, the raptured church is already there. So we can see here, um, when we compare Daniel 10 verses four through six to Revelation one verses 12 through 16, we see the man, okay, dressed in a robe. It says in Revelation, we see him dressed in linen. We know that's Jesus Christ and, and Daniel described there. 
we see the golden sash. We also see the golden, uh, the fine gold um, from Ufaz around his waist, a belt of fine gold around his waist. Okay, so he's going to be wearing a gold sash and a gold belt. Okay, gold sash around his chest, gold belt around his waist. Okay, we see the burnished bronze, his arms and legs, like the gleam of burnished bronze. Okay, and then we see in verse 15, in Revelation 1, verse 15, his feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. That's burnished bronze. Okay, so we're talking about the same character here. Both John and Daniel are talking about the same thing that they both saw. And notice what John says in Revelation. So we're, we have two witnesses here giving us this testimony about the sound of the multitude, the raptured church. We have Daniel and we have John. Notice what it says in verse 15. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Okay. Just look at the KJV. Many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Okay. So the great multitude. We see this also in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. And after this, I beheld. And by the way. If subsequent raptures happen throughout the tribulation period, because I'm not saying they're not going to, I believe that there are going to be multiple raptures, okay? And a lot of watchmen believe this. Those additional people are going to add to the multitude. Revelation 7, 9 through 10. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, okay? Again, that's all the Gentile nations, all the people on the earth, okay? That that the Lord, Lord God, is going to make the Jews jealous of a people who are not a people. It's all those people, all those Gentile nations, kindreds, peoples, tongues. The same 70 languages represented on the ship that Jonah was on, right? And before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, okay, that's linen, and palms in their hands, I love that, guys, because we're going to be doing what? We're going to be waving palms and singing songs, a new song. I can't wait to do that with you all. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Revelation 19, verses 1, 4, and 6. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. And the four and twenty elders, that's the twenty-four elders, and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And I heard it, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. So there we have both the word multitude and many waters being used in the same verse here, verse 6. Okay, It's interesting that it's verse 6, and we're right on the cusp of, you know, we're basically at the end of 6,000 years right at the precipice of day seven on the Lord's calendar, right? Um, the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, right? So we're right there at this precipice. That's another indicator in my opinion. The voice of mighty thunderings. Okay, so there are, these are three different ways to describe this voice of the multitude in different places in scripture. And I don't have time to go through all of these scriptures. There's so many to go through. But it's interesting that they're all tied together here in this one verse six. So multitude, great, you know, many waters, mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. All right. So what is the Daniel 10 window, guys? It's Nisan 3 to Nisan 24. How do we know that it's Nisan 3 to 24? Because Daniel says, and just read Daniel 10, you'll see. Actually, let's just pull it up really quick. I want to pull up that part of it. It's worth taking a quick look at. So let's go ahead and bring this up. Let's bring up my Bible. Let's go to Bible. Let's go to, we're going to go to Daniel 10. Okay. Now remember in here in um, verse two. So he mourns for uh, three weeks. Dang, I can't zoom in. I'm really sorry about that, guys. Um, I wonder if there's a way for me to turn off or change my view here. Um, close and then we can go full screen maybe. Yeah, I can't zoom. There's something wrong with my windows. It's not letting me zoom. It's really weird. 
So I'm just going to read this guys. Um, but so Daniel mourns for three weeks. Okay. And look what the angel Gabriel says here. Um, he says, uh, right here, verse 12, then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. So what was the first day? Well, we know exactly when the first day was because he arrives on the 24th day of the first month, Nissan 24, but for 21 days, three weeks prior to that, that's 24 minus 21 is three. Okay. So that was the first day that Daniel set his mind to gain an understanding and to humble himself before God. But look what he says here. But the prince of Persia, the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. So we're talking about a spiritual, demonic, satanic kind of warring there. Okay. The devil did not want Gabriel to get to Daniel to deliver the message. Okay. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, that's the Michael, the archangel came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia, which I believe is probably figuratively Satan, the devil. Now I have come to explain to you. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Now I have come to explain to you. When is the now? It's Nissan 24. Okay. And then Jesus, he sees Jesus. He talks to Jesus. Okay. Okay. Which is amazing. All right. So now we know that that window is Nissan three to Nissan 24. All right. So where are we on the calendar? Okay. I want to get back to basics here with this calendar because, you know, for any newcomers that are just super confused, I think they're just, they're, there are very, very few people who understand the timing, right? We just celebrated Easter, which is supposedly resurrection day. Right. And then there was good Friday before that. So, you know, and that was back in March. Well, that's not the true anniversary of those events. Okay. And so I think by and large, 99 point whatever percent of the world is, is not aware of God's real calendar, the real event calendar for biblical events. Okay. And so I think it's worth just covering this here and Ty Green does a great job of it, you know, and CJ Lovett covers this. And there's a lot of the watchmen talk about this, but, um, so what I've done here is I've gone to the moon phase calendar website. And I've grabbed the month of April, the moon phases for the month of April. Okay. Because the moon phases are 29.5 days, just over and over and over again. Okay. So, um, and they're very, very, everything's very precise here. And this is a calendar. The celestial clock that God has is something Satan cannot mess with. Um, Jared over at supernatural by design talks about this a lot. So this calendar, this April, 2024 calendar with the moon phases included each one of these boxes Okay, with the white number in the top right corner represents the day of the month. So Monday is April 1st. Saturday is April 6th. And you can see the moon phase for that day. This is what you call the Roman calendar. Okay, so you have the month of April and then you have the days. And on the Roman calendar, days start and end at midnight. So as soon as you get to, you know, you pass 1159, uh, PM and it goes on to midnight. Now you're in the next day. All right. Well, that is not how the Hebrew calendar works. That is not how the biblical calendar works. Okay. You can see down below here, I put the Genesis 131 verse in Genesis one, we see for each day that God creates something, God emphasizes in the last part of each one of those creation days, he emphasizes, and there was, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, and there was evening and there was morning, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth, the sixth day, there was evening and there was morning. So not only is he emphasizing that the day is that, you know, that he's creating things um, in a 24 hour period because there's evening and there's morning. Okay. There's, there's time. Um, but it's very important that it starts with the evening, the order of things listed in scripture, the way things are ordered and how they appear in scripture is extremely important. This is why the Hebrew day and the biblical day begins at evening time, okay, at sunset. So the Hebrew day um, begins at evening and it doesn't end at morning. It goes all the way up to sunset the next day. So to what I've done here on this calendar, you got to understand is I've created boxes for the Hebrew months that are color-coded and I'm shifting them over halfway 
so that it's not, the day isn't starting at midnight, but it's starting, I'm trying to indicate by shifting these boxes over halfway that the day is starting at sunset, okay? So we gotta shift it over. And I'm doing that so that you can see this overlayment of the Hebrew calendar with the, you know, the Roman Julian calendar, all right? So here, we, we just got through Adar, the month of Adar is now over, that ended with on April 8th with the eclipse. But remember, if the day begins at sunset, then it, it it's going to cross over two Roman calendar days. So Adar 29 is actually April 8th, and it includes a part of April 9th, okay? It's like half and half. That's why I'm shifting the box over, okay, and in, in, in adding the Hebrew month here. So Adar 29 ended the month of Adar. That was the, actually, it's the, normally it's the 12th month uh, on the Hebrew calendar, but we had a second month of Adar, which is, you know, the Lord is tarrying, waiting for as many of the Gentiles to come in. This is a mercy thing, okay? The fact that we had a 13th month, a second Adar, Adar 2. So we had two months of Adar with 29 days each, okay? Now, April 9th, this was Nisan 1. I want to make this clear. We have to set, in order to understand this window of time that Daniel is giving us here, Daniel 10, we need to make sure that we confirm and set this Nisan 1 date on the calendar, celestially, okay? We know that Nisan 1 starts on the first new moon, so you can see the new moon. It's basically a blacked out moon. There is no light, and when you see the first sliver of the new moon appearing, okay, this is a waxing crescent. Waning is when it's kind of going bye-bye and going towards dark, all right? So when you see that, that waxing crescent, the first sliver of that new moon after the spring equinox, that marks Nisan 1, the head of the year, the first day of the first month. Nisan is the first month, month number one. Adar is month number 12. So we're transitioning from the end of the year, 2023 on the Hebrew calendar to 2024 right here in Nisan 1. Okay, I want to make that clear. So we're in a new year right now. We are in 2024. We just started it. We're on Nissan 3 right now. So as I'm recording this, it's April 11th, 2024 at like 7 p.m. All right. So we are literally right here. Sunset was several hours ago, you know, like 10 hours ago in Jerusalem. Um, right here on April 11th. All right. Nissan 3. So we're on Nissan 3. So now, now that you understand how this is working with these screen with the screenshot of the calendar, this Roman calendar with the moon phases and the color coding, let's go to the next slide. Okay. And feel free to take screenshots of this on your cell phone and keep it handy because this is a big month, guys. I believe this is a very, very big month. So here we are. I have the calendar filled out. You can see the days of Adar, the end of the month of Adar in blue. You can see that the, the uh, total solar eclipse on April 8th that marked the end of 2023 and the last month of Adar 2. And then you can see the 1% illumination of the new moon, the first sliver of the new moon on April 9th, starting Nissan 1. Now we go to Nissan 3. That is today. April 11th. That is today into April 12th. Okay. Sunset at April 12th is when Nissan 3 is going to end in Jerusalem, Jerusalem time. So that's when Daniel began fasting and praying, guys. And so, um, so there are the Nissan, the days of Nissan going forward. And then guess where Nissan 14, which is Passover, where does that land? That lands at sunset on April 22nd to sunset on April 23rd. So you can see that in red down there. Okay. Now we start the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We have seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We have Nissan 15. That's day one in the tomb. We have Nissan 16. That's day two in the tomb. And then we have Nissan 17. This is sunset April 25th to sunset April 26th. All right. That's Nissan 17, Jesus Christ's resurrection day, the third day. Remember, Jesus is the bright morning star. Now, Torah calendar is uh, calling out um, Nissan 19. So you can see how Nissan 19 is um, on April 27th at sunset going into April 28th down below on the next row there. Okay, so they're calling that out as first fruits. That's why I put the barley right there on, um, on Nissan uh, 19. Okay, 
Um, now it's ar arguable or debatable whether that's going to be the exact, you know, first fruits date. I'm just putting what's on tour calendar here. Okay. But if you want to get into a debate over what day that actually is, and you want to tell me what you think it is, just go ahead and put it in the comments. All right. The point is it's, it's going to be in this time frame, in this April kind of season here. All right. Um, which is really exciting. Okay. So just to confirm Nissan one again. Um, I follow this um, Facebook page, Devorah's Date Tree, because uh, they not only photograph the sighting over Jerusalem of the new moon, the first sliver of the new moon after the spring equinox every year. They do this. They've been doing it for years. But they also um, do thorough barley inspections for the first fruits. All right. So you can go to their Facebook page. You can see the pictures they're taking of the barley and the moon and everything else for each each year. Um, it's very good to have this resource. Now, the red arrow is actually pointing to the sliver of the new moon. It's kind of a low-res image that they have. You can see it. It's probably hard, to, impossible to see on a cell phone probably. It was a 1% illumination, very, very skinny sliver, but it was sightable uh, because it had enough degrees over the horizon after the sunset to be visible. The image that you see with the uh, shadow of the guy, the silhouette of the guy pointing, that was taken in Gaza, okay, um, around the same time. And that is, uh, those are Palestinian, that's a Palestinian guy actually pointing to it. Why is a Palestinian guy pointing to the to the new moon there? Well, because that marks the, the day of Eid, Eid Mubarak or Eid al-Fitr, um, which is the big Muslim holiday because it ends Ramadan, okay? So this, it's, it's funny how, this this moon is a big deal. It it's the moon that needs to be cited to call out the end of Ramadan, right? And and the celebration of Eid, but it's also the marks the beginning of the year on God's calendar. Okay, so continuing on into May 2024, here is the loony the lunar kind of Roman calendar, lunar calendar uh, dates with the Roman calendar dates in white at the top for May. We can see when uh, unleavened bread is ending. Okay, that's ending um, on uh, Nissan uh, 21. All right, and then, um, which is in April. All right, and then we have when we see Nissan 24 here, which is sunset May 2nd to sunset May 3rd. Okay, that is Nissan 24. That is when Daniel has the vision where he sees Jesus, he hears the voice of a multitude. And I'm asking the question, is the multitude the sound of the raptured church? I believe it is. And um, Nissan uh, and all the dead ra raised in Christ, you know, that that are, um, you know, receive glorified bodies. And we will be as, as Christ, as he is with his glorified body. We're going to be like that. Um, the interesting thing is Nissan 24 is exactly seven days after Nissan 17, which is resurrection day. So after resurrection day, you count off seven days and boom, there you go. You're at Nissan 24. Okay. And Nissan 24 is after first fruits. So it's interesting that Daniel hears the voice of the multitude after resurrection day and after first fruits. And also Nissan 24 is after the feast of unleavened bread. So basically all the spring feasts are over. They've got to be fulfilled at this point when Daniel has this vision. Is that interesting to you? Because it is to me. Now, here we are um, looking at the sunrise on April 25th. Um, we're also going to look at this for April 26th. It basically looks the same on April 26th, okay? And um, we can see Venus there I have selected, and the Venus phase is at 98%. And we have this verse here from 2 Peter 1, 19. Now, look at, what, look at what it says here. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Yeah, that's the prophetic message about the rapture. The uh, you know when Paul is talking about the mystery, we shall not all sleep, right? But raised imperishable, the dead in Christ rise first. Then those who are alive and remain are caught up to meet them in the air, to meet the Lord in the air, to be with Him forevermore. Okay, that is the prophetic message that Peter's talking about. Okay, not only that, but all the prophets that speak about the rapture. It's the, there's hundreds of passages in the Bible about it. So we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, what is the light shining in a dark place? Remember, Jesus Christ is the light of the world, right? We're all part of his body, 
Remember, you don't you don't light a candle and put it under a bowl. You don't light a lamp and put it under a bowl. No, no, you let the light shine for the whole room to see. That's us. That's that's the picture of the church. Okay? So we are that light shining, the Holy Spirit living within us. That we are that light shining in a dark place. Until when? Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Who is the morning star? The morning star is Jesus Christ. He declares that himself, that he is the bright and morning star. Look at Job 38, 7. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Now, I want to animate this on Stellarium so that you can see what's going on here. Okay, because... Right here, we can see there's Venus and there's the sun, okay? There's Venus and there's the sun behind it. Remember, in uh, in Scripture, in Mark and Matthew, when the women arrived at the garden, I guess, or the, the, uh, the tomb, where Jesus was laid in the tomb at the garden, okay? Um, the stone had already been rolled away. And when was the stone already rolled away? Well, it was rolled away before dawn because it was the sun was rising. The sun was actually coming up. It was sunrise. The sun was rising up over the horizon as the women arrived at the tomb. And then the apostles came after that. Okay. There is like roughly a 15 minute window. It's not exact, but it's about 15 minutes between when Venus comes up over the horizon and then the sun rises. That's important because Jesus is the bright morning star. Okay, he rises before the sun comes up here. Okay, before the dawn, pre-dawn. Okay, pre-sunrise, I should say, because dawn is like basically happening here in Stellarium. So let's let's animate this. There's there comes Venus, and now Venus is up over the horizon. Now the sun's up. Okay, and you can just see the difference in the minutes there. Okay, so sun is rising right about there, 1954. And we'll back up to right about there. And we're at 19, kind of like, yeah, 28, 29, where Venus is coming up over the horizon. Okay, so there's about a 15 minute delta here. Okay, so that is the rising star. Now let's look at April 26th. I'll just back it up so you can see it. Satisfy your curiosity here. Okay, so again, there's the sun, there's Venus. There goes Venus coming up first. I don't know why it just kind of glitched out there, but let me just replay that. I think I have too much too much open on my on my computer right now, and it's kind of freezing. Okay, so there goes Venus, and then boom, 15 minutes later, the sun comes up, all right? So that's what I wanted to share with you there, all right? Now, so the stars, uh, let's look at these stars, guys, the morning stars. So let's look at some verses here, and this is not comprehensive, but it's a few to get you thinking. So the stars equal Jesus equal the church. If Jesus is the morning star, remember if Jonah is representative of Jesus and Jesus represents Jonah and the church is also the body of Christ, then it stands to reason that Jonah equals Jesus equals the church. Jonah equals the church also. Okay. Well, the same thing is true with the bright morning star. If Jesus is represented by Venus, the bright morning star, that wouldn't it make sense for us as a church, as the body of Christ, to also be represented by stars? Well, of course it does. And the Bible confirms that for us. So here we are in Hebrews 11, verses 10 and 12. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay. That city, it's like the temple of the Lord. It's like all the stones that build the temple. That's like part of the city, right? Therefore, Sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Remember the sand we looked at in the hourglass? Mm hmm. Revelation 1 19, 19 through 20. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand. And of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. They are all equal. That's the mystery of the seven stars. They represent the seven churches. Okay. 
Revelation 2, verses 27 through 29. Just as I have received authority from my father, right? Authority, like he's got the keys to death and Hades and everything. So during Passover, like resurrection day, he could go, you know, go down and, you know, go, he can open whatever doors he needs to. All right. And all those people that are, have died in Christ over the last 2000 years that are in heaven, he is going to give them glorified bodies. All right. And the dead are going to be raised incorruptible. That's what that is. Imperishable immortality. Verse 28, I will also give that one the morning star. Hmm. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you guys have ears? Are you hearing this? Revelation 22, verses 16 to 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Wow. The spirit and the bride say, come Maranatha King Jesus. Aren't we all saying that our, our in deep in our spirit, we're crying out for that. Aren't we? Okay. So going back again to the calendar. When is this Venus bright morning star rising again? Well, on Nissan 17. Again, that's sunset April 25th going into sunset April 26th. So really, April 26th, exactly the time that Barry Aw said that we should be going by April 26th. He, he's very intelligent. He knows exactly what he's talking about because he's looking at the same calendar I'm looking at. And right there, is basically, you know, the, the early morning hours with Venus coming up over the horizon in Jerusalem on April 26th. That's resurrection day. Now, again, I'm not saying the rapture is un unequivocally going to happen at that time. I'm just saying this is the highest watch time ever. And it would make sense that the rapture not happen on some random day. Everybody talks about imminency and all that. And yeah, I know it's in I know it's imminent, but if Jonah happened during that time, if Jesus happened during that Passover season, if the Exodus happened during the Passover season, it just makes sense. And it makes sense because it needs to prove, it would need to happen then in, in my mind to prove God's word is true. It authenticates God, God's word. It authenticates the feast. It authenticates Jonah. It authenticates Jesus Christ rising. Okay. And it's going to turn many unbelievers in two believers. That's my feeling. So here we are on timeanddate.com. I've got all kinds of purple in here, guys, because I'm super excited about, remember, purple represents royalty ruling and reigning. And we're just, we're on the cusp of that happening. That That's what the day of the Lord is all about. That thousand year millennial reign of Christ. Okay. And, and we being, you know, kings and priests ruling and reigning with him. Okay. Royalty. So there's April 25th, resurrection morning, could be April 26th. It looks pretty much the same. Okay, you can see it just down below there, 5.58 a.m. So the sunrise is just before 6 a.m. That's when the sun rises, all right? 15 minutes or so before that is when Venus comes up over the horizon, okay? The bright morning star. So that's what I'm calling out here, all right? Now, what about this concept of a pre-tribulation rapture and then this gap that everyone talks about before the tribulation begins like there's the rapture potentially and then a gap and then the tribulation okay and the gap provides a table setting time for a lot of the big tribulation events to get really swinging and getting getting in set up and into place okay so again we see in genesis 1 31 God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. Okay. The sixth day. So this sunset or the, or sunrise rather in purple here. Okay. On April 25th or 26th. Okay. Just before 6 AM. Okay. Like to me, it would make sense. Like if 
that came first. And then there's like, basically at sunset, when it starts getting dark, that that that's kind of symbolizes when the, when the tribulation kind of kicks off. And so my twin brother and I were talking about this and, you know, I said, Hey, you know, like, I think the, you know, cause 24 hours in a day is divisible by 12 and there are 12 months in a year. So isn't it just convenient that, you know, 12 times two is 24, right? So I said, you know, Hey, like, wouldn't it be interesting to see what happens when we overlay the 24 hours in a single day with the actual months in a year to determine you know, when is dawn and morning and afternoon and evening and night and all that, right? Day and night, okay? And we remember what Jesus said in John 11, okay? Time is a big deal to him. So Jesus answers, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light. Now, the light is only gonna be here a little while longer. We know that from scripture, the light of the world, Jesus Christ, right? Dwelling in those believers that have the Holy Spirit is going to be removed. And then the world's going to be in darkness. Okay. So there is a transition from day to night. And guess what I've discovered here? When you take the months, the 12 months of a year, okay, for each one of those months, you account for two hours. So looking at the 24 hour day, right? The first month would equate for hours one and two, all right? So like that would be like six to 8 a.m. And that's like month number one, okay? So that's like dawn, all right? So right here, you can see 12 hours are day and 12 hours are night. And you can kind of see, you know, midnight over there um, on the right where it's like black, right? I kind of tried to grade, make a gradient there for the sun's movement. Now, what I've done, I know this is an eye chart, okay? I know this is an eye chart and I zoom in on this on the next slide. So if you wanna take, if you're on a cell phone, which you probably are, just take a screenshot of this and then you can zoom in on it, way in after you take a screenshot. Or you can just, you know, screencast this video to your giant, like, you know, 70 inch TV and you can see this very clearly, which I would recommend doing. Um, but here I, I created this chart and it shows Passover, all right, so Passover and what the hours are when Jesus was crucified. And of course, leading up to this is that whole night where the, he gets arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane and um, he goes through, you know, all the, uh, you know, the the stuff with Pontius Pilate and then getting kind of tortured and stuff in the morning and then getting crucified at 9 a.m. Notice also the symmetry. This really popped out at me when there was three hours of darkness over the land between 12 p.m., noon and 3 p.m., and then he goes in the tomb. Notice these, the uh, symmetry between um, the crucifixion at 9 a.m. And then when he goes into the tomb just before sunset, sunset's around 7.15. Okay, so that's in the 14th hour. Sunset happens in the 14th hour there. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. When you overlay the month numbers to this time frame, these these 24-hour you know, slots here for each of those days, Okay, you notice that when Jesus rises, right? Like pre-dawn, like when the Venus, the morning star is rising. Okay, and then you put the 12 months down below, starting with Nisan, the first month. What do you notice? They line up. They actually line up. So Nisan, the beginning of the year is like morning, right? And then the fall feasts are getting into like the sunset, you know, nighttime. Okay, and remember that the days in the fall are also shorter. So here, when we're looking at these days in April, you'll notice that the sunset is like in the 14th hour. Well, that, that starts to crawl backwards to like the 12th hour. All right. And that's, you know, in Elul. Okay. We're dealing with the fall feast at this point. So there's a gap there. Okay. And I believe that the strongest potential for a scenario here is a rapture in uh, the spring feasts, okay? And all the typologies and archetypes and everything in scripture indicate this. And then once we get into uh, the fall feasts, we're now kind of at sunset nighttime. That's what those months represent later in the year. And the, it gets darker sooner. There's fewer hours of daylight, etc. Okay, so that is even indicated 
and the fact that there's less light during those times. So here is a zoom in on this. Okay. So if we're looking at the day that the 24 hours, right, of the day that Jesus rose from the dead, I'm just zooming in on that port, that part of it that's really important here between the feasts. And then you align those months, the Hebrew calendar and then the Roman calendar months to this. Then you can see that at dawn, all right, we're in the spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. It's right there. Okay. So I'm asking the question to you, my audience, is this, does this account for the pre-tribulation rapture time gap where we have a Passover or spring feast kind of rapture, and then a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens after that, that leads up to really the tribulation kicking off in earnest during the fall feasts. And that marks the start of the seven year timer for the tribulation period, a whole Shemitah cycle of seven years that then also ends. So sunset, right? This is kind of like sunset, the fall feasts. And the, what is the, when does the Hebrew day begin and end? The Hebrew day begins at sunset and it ends at sunset. And then the next day begins. So I'm, I'm asking the question, does it make sense that the tribulation would start at sunset and then end at sunset, the fall feasts with Jesus Christ returning at the fall feast and fulfilling the fall feasts? I believe so. So I do believe that there is a gap between a pre-tribulation rapture, which is the strongest time to happen during the spring right now, which is in the morning, okay? The bright morning star, we're talking about the morning, the day star and all that stuff, okay? And then a new biblical day starting at sunset with new events kicking off, tribulation events aligning with the fall feasts. Guys, we can see very clearly, clearly the uh, trajectory to the tribulation start. And I believe it's going to start in the fall with the fall feast, September, October timeframe. The question is, is it this year or is it next year? I think as Barry All says in his last video, it just, it's got to be this year because it just pushes it out too far when you get into a 2025 start time for any of this stuff. So September, October is the evening sunset time in the year, right? With the days getting shorter and darker. We've got the Iranian attack against Israel imminent, it seems like, or a, pre or a preemptive move by Israel so that, you know, to scare Iran from not attacking. And that could be, um, you know, Isaiah 17, one destruction of Damascus. We have war between, between uh, Russia, Ukraine, Europe, Na and NATO escalating. We've got, um, you know, we've got war rhetoric coming out of all the major countries and world leaders. We have an increase in volcanic and earthquake activity all over the world. The Stromboli, you know, volcano just went off, which was just spectacular, right? Epic. Um, we have BRICS plus, right? The the uh, Brazil, you know, Russia, India, China, um, et cetera, you know, South Africa, et cetera, plus countries coming together, right? Uh, Brother Ty Green does a lot of, um, and even Brother Jared have talked a lot about this, the BRICS countries. So, you know, that kingdom is, is rising out of the sea, right? 10 horns, 10 kings with the 11th king rising out of the sea and then subduing three kings. So there's some drama coming here. We have the U.S. military on highest level of alert since the Cold War. We don't even know what DEFCON it's at. They don't advertise the DEFCON levels, but I would, I would assume it's pretty high up there right now, okay? We have China preparing to take Taiwan. You know, I live in the San Francisco Bay area. I mean... You know, Xi Jinping was out here and met with Biden, you know, some months ago and just straight up told Biden like, hey, you know, uh, we're going to, I'm going to invade Taiwan and uh, you better not do anything, <laughs> you know? So he kind of put that shot across Biden's bow in, in their talk in San Francisco a few months back, right? We see sin, violence, sexual perversion, corruption, lies at all time highs, right? All time high. Just, it doesn't even take long to just surf the internet, turn on the television, look at movies, what's on TV these days. It's insane right? No politicians are honest. Everybody's lost. It's just unbelievable. So Matthew 24 is clearly in play, right? The Olivet Discourse. Song of Solomon, guys, is on. We are in that season. It is on. All that spring stuff about the birds and the flowers. I'm going on, I just went on a walk today this afternoon. It was beautiful looking at all the flowers and stuff. And there's a lot of purple flowers, which keeps reminding me of royalty ruling and reigning and it's coming, right? So. 
and there's just so much more, right? These are just a few bullets, but I'm, I'm, I know you guys have a ton of stuff that's like top of mind that you're on top of, that you're looking at, that you're seeing, that you're witnessing. I mean, you, you have to be living under a rock to not see how crazy the world has become. So I want to leave it here, guys. Again, second Peter one nineteen, we have the prophetic message with respect to the rapture as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Maranatha, King Jesus. Love you guys. We'll see you soon where I'm really excited to be waving palms and singing songs with you. And Brother Chooch, can't wait for that lobster dinner with Jesus as the guest of honor. It's going to be a good time. All right, guys, that's it for this one. We'll see you on the next one. Maranatha.